morning, church family. Good to see your smiling faces out here on a beautiful Sabbath morning. It's a special Sabbath morning. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. How long has Mother's Day been around? It is the 100th anniversary of Mother's Day today, well, tomorrow. And do you know who started Mother's Day? Well, what president voted Mother's Day in? Nice and loud. Who was president in 1914? Anyone alive then? Some close. Some had parents alive then. I believe it was Woodrow Wilson. Does that sound right? Going into World War I? 100 years. Well, there's some special things. I'm getting a little ring up here. There's some special things about Mother's Day that I wanted to share with you. Other than Easter and Christmas Eve, it is said that people attend church on Mother's Day behind just those two holidays, Easter and Christmas Eve. So there might be a few more here now in second service. Um, there are more flowers, even more than Valentine's Day, I'm told, that are purchased uh, during Mother's Day. And do you know what flower is supposed to be given? What is it? It's carnations, and do you know why? It was her favorite flower. So carnations. How many here like carnations? Roses are a little better. Yeah, we got a rose crown. Do you know what color you're supposed to give? White if your mother is deceased, and a colored carnation if she is still alive. Interesting, interesting. How many good stories in the Bible about mothers? I think um, the pastor's wife asked that same question about a month and a half ago when she preached. Um, do you know the answer? I can only think of three. I can think of two that are actually names are palindromes. You know what a palindrome is? The name is spelled forwards and backwards. Um, that would be Eve, Hannah, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I believe our f famous Bible worker, William Earnhardt, is preaching on Mary, the mother of Jesus, this morning. And so I had a choice to pick between Eve and Hannah, and I picked Hannah. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we hear the story of Hannah together this morning. 1 Samuel, I'll give you some time to get there. I'm still getting the night. Old Testament. We can try it again, and we're getting volume finally. First Samuel. Yes. My hearing's not good either, but I haven't met you yet. I'm Michael. You are? Hi, Jackie. Jackie, nice to meet you. I want you to know I was baptized in this church back in 2000. You were. So I have been a Seventh-day Adventist for 14 years. 14 years. I was baptized on April the 22nd. April 22nd, 2000. And that was Easter Sabbath that year. And that was Easter Sabbath that year. Praise the Lord. We're glad you're here this morning. See, people come Christmas Eve, Easter, and Mother's Day. We are so glad you are here. And she has, she's a mother, and she has four children. Praise the Lord. Verse 2. 
he had how many wives? Is that a problem? <laughs> it can be. And in this circumstance, it is. Solomon didn't think so. David didn't think so. Two wives. Well, we know that the Bible can be stranger than fiction. We don't have to create this. It's right there. So he had two wives. Were they treated equally? Well, let's look together. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and we're going to focus upon her life. But also notice, and the name of the other, and we're going to call her Penny. Penny and Hannah. Now, Penny had children, but Hannah had none. Is that a problem? Oh, yes. <laughs> that is a challenge because the bloodline, the inheritance, the family name, and I'm going to go so far as say the characteristics of God's people are passed down generation to generation. So this is a challenge because Hannah has no children. Um, I, when I pastored in Carolina, my last church, we had five couples in that church who could not have children. Five couples. It was tough. It was tough on them. It was tough because there was a longing desire to have kids, and they couldn't have them. And so it, it's, it's interesting. And here she is. So what do you do? What do you do? Notice verse 3. This man, that's Elkinah, went up from his city yearly, so once a year, to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, now we're going to introduce some more characters into the story. You know, every good story, we've got a warm-up. We have Elkina, and we've got the lineage, and he has two wives. Uh, Penny has children, Hannah doesn't have children. And now let's talk about another family. Notice now, the man went up twice a year, and the two sons of Eli were Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas, they were priests of the Lord, were there. Now, I want you to stick your finger in your Bible, but I have these wonderful ribbons I can put in. Let's learn about Hophni and Phinehas, because I don't like to talk about them, but we've got to at least learn about them. Turn over one page. We're going to go down to... Second, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. So we can kind of see about Hophni and Phinehas. Verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were what? Hmm. They were evil, they were corrupt, they did not know the Lord. But they're priests. Wait a minute, what's going on here? They were priests, but they didn't know the Lord. That's an interesting thing. We won't go into that. <laughs> But can you be a Seventh-day Adventist, or can you be a Christian and not know God? You might know all the rules, all the ceremonies. You might have been raised in the church, but you never had that encounter with God. It's very sad. And look at the result of that. So we're talking about parents and mothers, but notice this. Verse 13, And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, and remember, the story is, here they are once a year going to offer a sacrifice, going into the house of God. And there are these two sons there. As the priest custom with the people, when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. He would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the fish hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came here. So instead of tithes and offerings, kind of interesting. Ah, a mother just arrived with my sermon. Thank you. Now I can move back up here. That's what mothers do. They look out for you. Now I have my sermon. <laughs> it's going all right so far, but that was all without notes. Okay, back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Beginning 14, yes. So they would, they would get a part of the offering. So they ate this boiling flesh. Now, I'm, I'm personally been a vegetarian for 25 years, but many people are not. And I don't know if boiled lamb, goats. We, we always fried and 
broiled, but back then they boiled, which is kind of interesting. So they got a portion of it. But notice how evil the sons were. Verse 13, also before they burned the fat, the priest's servant who would come and say to the men who sacrificed, give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat for you but raw. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer, no, but you must give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, verse 17, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. So these were evil. They, they, they took more than what was theirs. That's what, that's what that's saying. And they were mean. They would take it by force if need be. And so these were the two kids of the high priest. So we got the other side of this story, Eli's sons. Now let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Continue the story. Verse 4. And whenever the time came for Elkinah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penny, his wife, and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give how much? A double portion, for he did what to Hannah? He loved Hannah. This reminds me of the story of um, Rachel and Leah, does it not? It's this dysfunctionality that exists that the, the husband loves one and more than the other. And I don't understand that. I've only loved one in my life. <laughs> and that's God's plan for us, is it not? To love one throughout eternity. And uh, we've been married 21 and a half years. All right. So, back to the story. But her rival provoked her. Oh, wait, verse 5. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb, and I'm not going there. I don't understand what that means. So does this verse tell us that sometimes God allows women to get pregnant, and other times he does not? Another sermon. Another sermon altogether. I don't have time for that. This is about Mother's Day. But it's interesting, because did not the same thing happen to Mary, the mother of Jesus? had no other children that we know of. Another sermon. Let's keep going. Verse 6, And her rival, that is Penny, provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it wasn't like they were friends. They were enemies. They provoked each other. It reminds me of a son and a daughter that I have. Are there mothers here this morning? <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the provoking, right? It's the comments, it's the poking, the prodding. Now, I'm not supposed to bring my kids in on sermons, but maybe once in a while I can do that. I didn't ask their permission, but you know what I'm talking about. Verse seven, so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Verse 8, Then Elkina, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, that's an interesting question. <laughs> what is the answer to that? Is she better to him than ten sons? How many say yes? How many say no? <laughs> Ten sons can accomplish a lot of things. And women were almost like cattle in this day and age. But they had potential, did they not, to have children. And some of you know the rest of the story, of course. But that's an interesting question to ask. And should we ask questions we don't want to hear the answer to? <laughs> Verse 9. So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, and Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow. Here it comes now. This is the exciting part. O Lord of hosts, if you will not indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give me, your maidservant, a male child. Then I will give him 
to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall be upon his head. And so it happened. As she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. Now that's an interesting thing. Crazy, crazy priest. He's used to these rotten kids, and he thinks this woman is drunk, and she's praying. She's praying her heart out. Verse 14, so Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. It's kind of interesting. What happened to the disciples at Pentecost? They thought they were drunk. <laughs> interesting, when the Holy Spirit is upon people. The confusion, when other people don't recognize what that truly is. It's the Spirit of God falling upon his people. All right. Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. There was a change that took place in her life. She went to the Lord, and her prayer was answered. Verse 18. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and there was no longer sad. Therefore, verse 19, she arose in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house of Ramah, and Elkinah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked from him from the Lord. And the man Elkinah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But, verse 21, Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not take up, I will not go up until the child is weaned, and that was about three years old. And then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there, how long? Forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. So the woman stayed and nursed his son until she had weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, some flour, some wine, and brought it to the house of the Lord. The child was young, we know, about three years old. And then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord. All right, now to the sermony part. <laughs> I have a top ten list of what has just happened. I want to kind of categorize it in the ten little nuggets that you can take with you. And... Um, because it's Mother's Day, I want to suggest to you, um, in my house, every day is Mother's Day. Because it's Mother's Day to do the dishes, and it's Mother's Day to do the laundry, and it's Mother's Day to make lunch, and it's Mother's Day, is it not? It's Mother's Day to run home and grab my sermon off my desk. Is that what Mother's Day is all about? No, it's a time of taking mom out to eat, it's a time to pick up the phone and give her a call if she's long distance. It's not Mother's Day to do things. It's been tradition in my house for my daughter Jennifer to make food and bring it to mommy in bed. That is what Mother's Day is all about. But now let's go back to the story. So what is going on here? Well, did Eli know how to raise children? He was busy doing his priest thing, okay? It's an interesting story, because just imagine if I took my son at three years old and dropped him off at the general conference office up in Silver Spring, Maryland, knowing that the conference president's children were horrible. They were stealing from the treasury, 
And in Florida, I had to look it up, the lawyer in me, Florida Statute 827.03, abuse and neglect of a child. A caregiver's failure or omission to provide a child with the care, supervision, services necessary to maintain the child's physical and mental health, including but not limited to food, nutrition, clothing, shelter, supervision, medicine, medical services, that a prudent person, there's the standard, would consider essential for the well-being of a child. Well, she promised any of that. We knew <laughs> this was a problem. <laughs> so what do good mothers do when they're faced with the dilemma? Did she make an oath? Yes, I'm going to give my child to the Lord. And the only person to give that child to was Eli, the priest, with his horrible children. So what are the takeaways now? All right. Number one. I have a top ten list, and this will go rather quickly. Number one, good mothers place their children first. Good mothers place their children first. Could Hannah have divorced? Could she have divorced? Her husband was sleeping with another woman. Could she have divorced? Her husband was producing other children from another woman. Could she have divorced? But she instead chose to stay with her man. I think there's a country song like that. I didn't say it. You said it. Stand by your man. And I want to suggest to you, in the toughest times, mothers stand by their man and with their children. Now, I know there's times to get out when there's abuse. But for the most part, the surveys that I was going to read to you, and I'm going to move on, say that Children of divorced parents, which is 50%, you understand one out of every two are going to grow up that way. They have higher rates of school dropouts, teenage pregnancy, STDs, and all these challenges and problems because they don't have their parents. Parents are better to stick together. Point number two, good mothers are strong. Now, I have a quote from Ellen White. I rarely quote from her, but this is from Adventist Home, page 240. Did you know that next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest known on earth? I want to read that again. Next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest known on this old earth. End quote. The power of a mother is strong. Point number three. And it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Excuse me, 1 Samuel 1, 10. Good mothers are praying mothers. Amen? That was only two people. I want to say this again. Do we have any mothers in the house? Good mothers are praying mothers. It's interesting the way it's worded in Samuel. It says they cry and they pray. They pray and they cry. That's an interesting way, isn't it? Here's a poem. I had a Christian mother who taught so carefully. There came a time when the world came to allure. I no more thought of her love so good and pure. She made my room an altar, a place of secret prayer. And there she took her burden and left it in God's care. I went my way unheeding, careless of the life that I led, until one day I noticed elbow prints on my bed. While I wrestled in my conscience, mother wrestled in prayer, till that little room seemed hallowed, because off she met him there. My stubborn heart was broken, but those imprints on my bed... Her constant love and prayers were like coals upon my head. Mother love and God love are a combination rare and one that can't be beaten when sealed by earnest prayer. And so at last the flight was won and I to Christ was led and mother's prayers was answered by her elbows on my bed. There it is. There it is. 
praying for our children. Good mothers are praying mothers. Number four, good mothers take hold of God. Verse 11, and she made a vow saying, O Lord God Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me. She challenged God. You see this? Don't forget your servant, but give her a son. You hear what she's doing? She's laying a hold on God and saying, God, you do for me and I will do for you. And God answers prayers like that. And Samuel means heard of God. God heard her prayer, and that became his name, Samuel. Number five, mothers never give up. Verse 12 says, Hannah multiplied praying. I want to go to another briefly. I found another one. I didn't mention it from the outset. But if you look in Hebrews 11.23, we don't have her name, but it's the story of Moses. And Moses' mother was, nice and loud, Jochebed. And w- did she pray? Yes. Did she act? Did she ever give up? Never give up. What did she do with Moses? Of what? Made out of what? That's right. Bull rushes, reeds, put them out there, and never gave up, continued to pray, knew exactly how many two-year-olds and under died that day? Every, everyone that I know of, except for him. And the mother never gave up. Number six. I found this one interesting. It's a little longer in my notes. Good mothers have high expectations for their children. I want to tell you two effects, then go to the Bible text. There's something called the Pygmalion effect. And that is the phenomenon whereby the greater the expectation is placed upon your children, the greater they will perform. And I'll give you an example of that, but there's an opposite truth. It's called the Golem effect. If you place low expectations on your children, they won't even raise to that bar at all. So here's the story. An elementary school teacher randomly selected six students to say these words. You're going to shine. You have potential. You're special. And by the end of the year, they achieved, and I'll give you the number, but there's another group. You can't do anything. You're not smart. You're not going to pass this grade. Just that reassurance or that negative comments, here comes the statistics. They checked their IQ at the end of first grade, and the ones that the teacher said were special increased 27.4%. The ones that said were not special decreased over 40%. It sounds sad. You take these kids and you ruin them for life. But notice just that as parents, as mothers, if we have high expectations. Can I pick someone out this morning? Can I pick on someone this morning? I didn't rehearse this. (laughs) Chris, I'm going to pick on you. I don't know if you know, but Chris just graduated with his PhD. (laughs) Is your mother living? Is she proud? Did she challenge you as a child? (laughs) My mom went to College Dale Southern one year and dropped out. So, but your your mom has a PhD as well. Is there a high expectation there? Boy, that gives me shivers just to think that. (sighs) Good mom, praise the Lord. High expectation. And, and prayer, and prayer. Boy, that's, I could stop right there, but I'm going to keep going. I didn't even ask him ahead of time. Ah, the next one. Good mothers have faith in their children. 1 Samuel 1.18, may your servant find favor in your eyes. She prayed, and then she went her way. Here are those verses. 
Do you have faith in your children? Train up a child in the way you should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from them. Proverbs 22, 6. Another interesting one that I found was Ezekiel 16, 44. I don't go to Ezekiel much, but this is what it says. Everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb about you. Like mother, like daughter. Ezekiel 16, 44. And that simply is this. How we act, I put we in there, I can be a mom today too. How we act, our children will act. So now I want to talk about dads for a minute and a half. And this is sad, Dad, so if I can get through this out without tearing up, I'm going to go through this. This is for the dads out there. A secular song, but the one that means so much to me, unfortunately, it's a secular song. But here it goes. And I, I delivered my own children, by the way, so this is why this means a lot to me. Um, my son was born underwater in a birthing tub, and my daughter was born... Uh, I delivered both of them. So when I read this song, it, it's, it's the relationship between me and my son, which I hope doesn't go the way that the song goes. And you'll begin to know the words, but um, I'm going to read them to you. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there are planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it, and as he grew... He'd say, I'm going to be just like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be just like you. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. That's okay. And he walked away. But his smile never dimmed. And he said, I'm going to be like him. You know I'm going to be like him. Well, he came home from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just have to say, Son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? But he shook his head and said with a smile, What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you, if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle. The kids have the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. We'll have a good time then. You see, the sad thing is, is our kids become just like us. It can be a good thing, but it can be the times when we just don't have time because of work and bills and sickness. Do we really spend time with our kids because they will turn out just like us. Big breath number eight. Good mothers have a saving relationship with God. First Samuel 1 19. Hannah daily worshipped God. Not just on Sabbath, but daily. A quote says the Bible of a good mother never needs dusting because your old Bible is probably true because she's read it through and through. Number nine, good mothers are desperate. Hannah had three years. She looked on her baby as an offering to God. Should you take a three-year-old infant to church? They won't get anything out of it, will they? No, 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 they can't understand a thing. Famous book, at least it was 20 years ago. All I really needed to know, I learned when, in kindergarten. And I wish I learned all the things that I needed to learn. Maybe I would be a much better person. But these are the things that Robert Fulgham said you should learn. 
Number one, share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't think, take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some, think some, draw, paint, sing, dance, play, and work another day. Take naps in the afternoon. And when you go out into the world, watch for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Powerful words, is it not? Finally, good mothers give their best to their children. Hannah gave all that she had to Samuel. The only thing that she had was a coat, and every year she would take it to him. This handmade coat reminds me of the story of Joseph, does it not? The coat of many colors. I want to end on this last story. I want to tell you about a four-year-old that was playing kickball in his front yard. This is going to be a sad story, so be ready for it. <laughs> and he kicked the ball out into the street, and you know how kids can be. That's why they have speed bumps and signs that say, slow children at play. So he kicked it out in the street, and unfortunately that car did come along. And this was a small town. So it took a while for the ambulance to come and took that little boy to the emergency room. And unfortunately, he had AB negative blood, which is a rare kind of blood. You know, it's the kind of blood that you gotta find particular blood donors to give blood. Well, the mom knew that she had the same kind of blood, so they hooked her up with a blood transfusion during surgery and gave her son blood. Well, it wasn't enough, as you can imagine. Several pints of blood was lost. So she went out into the waiting area and began to pray, began to pray. And not long after she prayed, a man came in and said, I have the blood that you need. Take it from me. The man went in. He gave his blood, but they noticed there was something wrong. You see, this man began slipping into a coma. And then as they got him on the bed, and they put all the things they put on, it wasn't a man at all. It was a woman. It was that mother. She went out. She bought something to put on her face that looked like a beard and a cap, and she went in. And unfortunately, the boy lived, but the mother died. She gave so much blood to save the life of her child. And Jesus has done the same thing for us, hasn't he? He's shed his blood so that we might live. So that is the story of Hannah. Simple story of a mother who prayed and a mother who gave her child up and brought him a simple coat every year. But there's some takeaways that we can all take home. And now I want to sing together with you our closing hymn. And as the praise team comes forward, Mother's Day, 100 years ago, it all began. But mothers have been around how long? since the beginning of time. And we all have mothers, and it's time to honor her. And uh, let's honor her by standing and singing together our closing hymn. Hymn number? 565. 565, For the Beauty of the Earth. Let us stand together as we sing. Testing, testing.
Our Father, we lift up our song of praise to you for the mothers you've given to us. Lord, some of us has lost our mothers, and Lord, we want to be reunited with them so soon. Please come. Others have mothers that are failing in health. They're in nursing homes and assisted living centers. And Lord, I pray that we would call them and send them a card and bring them roses and carnations. And Lord, others are healthy and happy and a part of our lives. And Lord, we thank you for them, that you have granted them peace and wisdom to raise us. Lord, the mothers now, I invite them to dedicate their lives to you once again. Lord, as Hannah prayed silently, Lord, I ask for the mothers here to pray silently, dedicating their hearts and lives again to their children. So, Lord, we are thankful, we are grateful, because of your grace and of your love. In Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. Okay, we're going to have the children's story now. Excellent message today. Thank you. The Lord is good. So, all the kids want to come down. We have a message. Maybe if you have an extra dollar in your pocket, you can hold it up and the kids will pick it up and it will go towards our TAA students to help them out. And... Uh, just come on down. Hold those dollars up nice and high so they can be seen. If you have a five dollars, that'll work, or quarter or a penny, whichever you have will it will all help. There you go, buddy. Okay, I see Mr. Ray has one held up. Just come on down, guys. Here we go. Did everybody have a good week? Good. I had a good week, too. Come on down. Hey, guys. Hey, give me five. <laughs> oh, here we go. And we got another little girl coming up. Hello. How are you? All right. Oh, closed it up a little too soon. Oh, wow. You guys did good on picking up those dollars. Thank y'all. So we've got a story, just a short one. Would somebody like to have a pray word of prayer? Okay. Don't want to forget that one. Good deal. Okay. I'm going to sit down here with you. I make a little more noise getting down on the ground than y'all do. You know, I had an itch right here on the top of my foot, and it itched so bad I was scratching it. Feels good to scratch it, don't it? Yes. Well, let's have a word of prayer before we start. Lord, as we hear this story, please let its true meaning come through. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Okay. This is a story about a mother, because what's tomorrow? 
Mother's Day, exactly right. So this story starts off with the mother is putting her little baby to bed for a nap. And as she comes out of the room, she hears the phone ringing. And she answers the phone, and it's the first thing she hears, oh, sweetie, I've fallen and I can't get up. And she recognizes the voice right off the bat. Okay. And she recognizes the voice right off the bat. And it's the elderly lady down the street, Mrs. McKinnon. And she recognizes that voice right away. And she says, I'll be right down there to help you because the lady had fallen down and she couldn't get up. Now, this happens to Mrs. McKinnon all the time. But she ran down to a couple of houses down the street because she knew her baby was sound asleep and she'd only be gone a few minutes. So she ran down there and went into the front door and helped Mrs. McKinnon up and she was checking with her and said, are you okay? And she said, yes. And then she heard a siren and she looked out the front window and this fire truck was coming by. And then she saw some more neighbors walking down the street. And she went to the door and looked out, and the fire engine had stopped right in front of her house. And she looked down, and she saw smoke coming out of her windows. And she thought about her baby right off the bat. And she ran out to the sidewalk and was pushing past the people. And when she got down to the front door, there was a fireman standing right at the front door and said, no, you can't go in. And she says, I've got to, and she pushes past him, and she runs into the house, and, but she knew right where she was going. She ran right to the baby's room and picked the baby up, and it was okay, and she covered it up with a blanket, and then when she turned to go out of the house, the smoke and the flames were just coming all around her, and she got just about to the door, and she fell down on her knees. Yes, but she fell down on her knees, and the fireman who had stopped her was looking in the door at her, and she reached, held out her baby. So the fireman took the baby and then reached back and grabbed her and pulled her out. The baby was okay. Now, she was burned a little bit, so they took her to the hospital, and our families took care of the baby. Now, some years later, little Marjorie had never noticed that her mother's hands were burned because all she knew was her mother loved her and always she had the softest hands, the Marjorie. But one day she came home from school because some of the other kids at school had asked her, what happened to your mother's hands? Why are they so scarred up? And she asked her mother and she said, well, I've been meaning to tell you about this when you were a baby, there was a fire. And I ran into the house to get you out. And when I pulled you out, my hands got burned. She said, but it was worth it because I love you so much. And then mom said, do you know that somebody else loves you so much that he has scars on his hands too? And she said, who is that? He said, she said it was Jesus that soldiers had taken him and he had laid down and gave himself up because he loved us so much. And they drove big nails into his hands and hung him on a cross so that he would die. But he rose three days after he had died. Rose so that he could take us all back to heaven when he comes back. Now he spent 40 days with his disciples so that everybody knew that he had risen and that when he comes back, mom told Marjorie that when he comes back, we can ask to see his scars and that when he holds out his hands, that you will know from the scars in his hands how much he loves us. Did you like that story? I did too. That's it. Would somebody like to have a closing prayer? 
maybe? Oh, go ahead. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for you give us and, and, and bless everything we you give us and, and hope. I hope we be good and, and, and thank you for your love and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. morning church happy sabbath happy mother's day sabbath uh it's my honor to come up here before you all to uh just take a minute out here to just say thank you to all our mothers that have gone on before us that are here with us that we love so much um it's just you know you can never say enough about mothers it, that's what it's all about so you know uh it, it's funny how God works because I've been trying to think like, what am I going to say? You know, I did my little thing last year and, and you know, I don't want to say what I said last year. I said, you know, maybe I could say something about Hannah. <laughs> nice sermon. So then I was looking, I said, you know, I've always heard nice sermons on Mother's Day, those little tear jerkers. What about the woman who burned her hands and got the baby? Thanks, Mike. So that might got me, the other might got me. So anyway, it's all good because it's all about mothers. So um, I do have a few words to say, and um, I think uh, we can all relate. Everybody I know says that my mom is the greatest, even though we all have mothers, but our mother is the greatest. And I think that's wonderful. And you know, as I reflected on how our mothers to us as we're babies, they're our first introduction to God's love. And I mean, if you think about our lives, how we mess up and, you know, how we've done things as children and our moms forgive us and, you know, even though we deserve a lot more punishment than they end up giving us and sometimes they have to give us a punishment, but right after they love us, right, you know, after they've given out that punishment and sometimes, you know, as I got older and became a parent, I finally understood what they meant about this hurts me more than it hurts you. So, you know, we really just need to give it up to our mothers. And I just wanted to remind us of some of the, you know, strong women in the Bible who, um, like Hannah, that, you know, wanted a child so bad, had so much love in her that she prayed, even when, as, as, the, as Mike was saying, you know, her womb was closed. You know, God works miracles, you know, and he answers prayers. And there's something about mother's prayers, you know, that I think that are just a little bit different from every other one's prayers. Uh, you know, I know, and you, a lot of you know my story. If it wasn't for my mother's prayers, I think sometimes I wouldn't be here. So it's, you know, the prayers of a mother are lifelong. They're not just, you know, once in a while or, you know, when something happens. I know mothers must have scabs on their knees and on their elbows for the way they go down in prayer for us. So, I mean, it's just amazing that kind of love, you know, no matter what we do, that, that maternal love, which is like God's eternal love, is just, is just amazing. So I just wanted to, you know, say a, a, a quick word, um, uh, a couple quotes that I've heard over the years that, that stick with me. Um, William Thackeray said, mother is the name for God in the lips and hearts of little children. And it's so true. You know, again, the the images that we get from a child that are grooming us into having that love for God, you know, and, and, and understanding how he can love us when we so don't deserve it at, at many times. Um, Abraham Lincoln talked about, I remember my mother's prayers and they have always followed me and they've clung to me all my life. And you know, those, those prayers are everlasting, you know, uh, and, and again, God's love is everlasting, and, and his promises are so true. And um, it, it, it's just when you really sit, sit and think about mothers, you know, it's a shame that we only recognize them on one day. And I mean, every day uh, should be Mother's Day, as we all know. 
and you know, and going back to other women of the Bible, I thought about Naomi, you know, and the love that she gave for Ruth that wasn't her biological daughter. Yet the love that she showed Ruth was amazing and that Ruth didn't want to even go back to her biological mother. She stayed with Naomi and traveled back to Bethlehem with her. And you know, there's so many women in this church and in our lives that may not be biological mothers. However, they're a mother in every sense of the word. So it's just amazing that not even as a, a mother, but women's love and the heart of a woman is just amazing that they have so much love in them. And, you know, when they say it takes a, a, a whole church to raise a child or a community to raise, raise a child, that, that is so true when you see all these women that may not have children of their own, but they have that love and you, we all have a teacher or some woman in our life that we rem remember outside of our mothers that was just as important. Um, and then when you come down to, to Ruth that, you know, through the love that she learned from Naomi, through her lineage came David, and through her lineage came Jesus, you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's just amazing the power of the woman. And you know, as men, uh, there's a quote out there, it says, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. So I mean, you know, even... Uh, as men, you know, some, some people say, look at the, the mother of the man, how the man treats his mother, you'll see how he'll treat his wife. So we need to remember as men how important these women are reflecting on our own mothers and reflecting on our wives and how our wives are mothers to our children. So uh, even as it is Mother's Day, the men, we, we need to remember our wives and our mothers as well in a special way. And finally, the last woman I want to recognize is Mary her immaculate conception, but she was the one who, it blows the mind to think that Jesus came to this earth, who created this earth, but came back in human form, had to learn about himself as taught to him by his mother. So Mary is teaching God about himself. And I mean, what a job that was for her to instill all those things in him as a young man as he you know, came in to learn his divinity and his purpose in life. So from Bible times up until now, I mean, it's all about mothers. You know, when, when we see sports and, and, and things like that, when people, they flash the man on the camera, you know, everyone says, hi, mom. They don't say hi, dad, but it's, you know, hi, mom. And, you know, Kevin Durant just got MVP and he talked about, you know, his mother and things like that. So it's all about moms and I just, I'm glad to come up here and just remind us on this uh, Mother's Day Sabbath to remember your mom if she's far away, give her a call. You know, if she's somewhere, like, you know, Mike was saying, if she's in a nursing home, she's, you know, go visit her. And if she's gone on before you, remember her because as, as a man or as people in general, your mother makes you the man that you are or the, the mother makes you the person that you are. So we all owe it to our mothers. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. So on this Sabbath day, remember throughout the day, it's all about mothers. And I think not just today, but every day. Remember your mom, her love for you, and that it goes on from birth to death. There's nothing like a mother's love, and it'll always be with you. So hats off. If I had a hat on, I'd take it off. Hats off to all the mothers here. We're thankful for you to be here. And at this time, I would, um, we're going to show a video here real quick. And while the video is showing, I want the uh, young people to come up uh, to, uh, we have a little token to give the mothers. And if um, you don't have a child here, or if the mothers could stand and we can uh, hand out a little token just to say thank you, we love you. And um, I guess that's all I have to say. So right now we'll take a look at this video. So children, please come up front. And um, every, each mother, raise your hand so we can make sure we give you a small token. Thank you. Here's to the mothers. Here's to the boo-boo kissers. Here's to the get up and warm the milk at 2 a.m. women. You are braver than you know. You make the music that makes the life, that gives the rhythm to the day in and out.
Here's to the mothers. Here's to the boo-boo kissers. Here's to the get up and warm the milk at 2 a.m. women. You are braver than you know. You make the music that makes the life, that gives the rhythm to the day in and out and in again. Courageous. You deliver babies by C-section or adoption certificate or by push and pant and wailing battle cry of birth. You give more than you think you have. And when you're empty, when you're bone dry, you wring out one more drop, one more bottle, one more soothing the temper tantrum. Hero, you make a budget stretch. You clip coupons, you fight ketchup stains. You face the awkward parent-teacher moments. You listen, you translate for your child. You do the hard work of teaching at every turn. You find a hundred new ways to answer a hundred new versions of the question, why? Champion, you show up, you take photos, you cheer. You shuttle boys and bags of gear between sports fields and serve up ice cream afterwards. You disagree with him. You make her change her skirt, but you love fiercely from beneath those unruly bangs. You learn to laugh at your reflection. You revel in your smiley wrinkles. Real, you lose your temper. You yell and apologize and stamp your foot and prove that you are human. You cry. You venture out into an ocean of vulnerability with only a small dinghy and two short oars to keep you afloat when you become a parent. Anchor. You yield your figure, your abs, your size four jeans, but your will turns to muscle unheard of. It grows strong with determination. No one will wound these children without going through you first. You are a last harbor, a lighthouse in the storm of internet and Facebook, failed grades and peer pressure. But in the everydayness of these moments, you start to feel it. The weight of glory, the glorious ordinary. And on your quietest, least interesting days, you get better at hearing the music of motherhood. Slowly, a harmony rises from the collection of tasks every mother cycles through in a day. The sacred marriage of the mundane and the eternal. The small directly related to the massive. Kids walking around like so much eternity with skin on. There is no part of your everyday wash and rinse and repeat routine that isn't significant. You make the music that makes the life that gives the rhythm to the day in and out and in again. You are braver than you know because you mother. Two more minutes with a few announcements. We have a second reading of transfer of membership from our church for Karen, and I'm gonna butcher the last name, Chenevert. I'm gonna butcher a city, the known assassin.